Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. So hi. I'm Jane Greenberg. I'm a faculty member at Drexel University College of Computing and Informatics. Um, great to see people. It's been just uh, great to have an opportunity to interact with colleagues and friends. I forgot how much fun it is to attend a conference. So thank you to CNI. Um, getting dressed up in uh, work clothes, that's another story. But um, really great to be here. Um, so it's great to be here. And it's our absolute pleasure to have an opportunity to share about the LEADING program. LEADING is an IMLS National Digital Infrastructure Initiative. LEADING was developed to scale up the original LEADS program. So LEADS stood for LIS in data science. And that was also a national uh, supported a uh, national IMLS project, and that was developed for iSchool doctoral students across the country. And iSchool doctoral students came and participated in Drexel's data science education program. Uh, they did an online curriculum and then in a boot camp, and then they had immersive experiences working with leading uh, uh, mentor sites, or leads mentor sites, pardon me, uh, n major libraries, archives, data centers, and so forth. And they did, worked with real data, and it was an intensive summer program for PhD students. And every time I spoke about leads and some of my colleagues, we would hear from early and mid-career people, oh, could I participate in something like that? I would love to participate in something like that. So the motivation for leading is to make the program available to early and mid-career people. And so the leading project now combines LIS, early and mid-career fellows, along with iSchool doctoral students. And you'll see on the right-hand side the overall model. And on the left-hand side, there are what are called nodes and mentor sites. And many of the mentor sites were participants in LEADS and stayed on through the LEADING project. On the right, you see more of a visual, and there's a sort of triangle in the, in the center where you see Drexel, you see San Diego, and Montana State University. And we oversee the coordination of the fellows that participate in the program. OCLC is also a hub, and they're a co-educational hub. Drexel University serves as the chief coordinating hub and oversees the data science program. So a little bit about the data for the leading program. As I said, there's four hubs and 15 nodes. We have 31 dedicated mentors who work with the fellows, eight Drexel LIS data science faculty, we also have a diversity, equity, and inclusivity task force. And that task force is made up of LEADS fellows from the earlier program. So they are IS doctoral students. Some of them have moved on now to faculty positions and professional positions. And they've been integral to helping us with recruitment, reviewing curriculum material, and so forth. We also have an advisory board that helps oversee the leading project as we're growing this network. And I just want to pause for a second. If you are uh, a, at an institution that has had a LEADS fellow or has a leading fellow, if you're a mentor, if you're a member of our, our advisory board, um, could you please wave your hand or something so we can just sort of see? There's a few of you around here, and I want to just say, Great, over there, thank you, because you're really what helps make leading successful. I also want to just give a little kudos to Rebecca Koskala, who's sitting there. Rebecca, sorry, you got to put your hand up. Because part of the model for leading, I learned a lot from Rebecca participating in the Data One data net and working with fellows. Um, even though the fellows come to Drexel for the data science boot camp, they do the, the fellowship virtually. So there's our data. There are 24 fellows in the first cohort. And 
here's our map. There's an interactive map on the leading website so you can see how, we, how we're expanding and we actually have, as far as Hawaii, we've got Jonathan here today, um, but the map can't quite do justice here in a slide because there's uh, you know, hubs on top of nodes on top of mentor sites. And here are our 2021 fellows. I wish we could have them all here, but we are delighted, I shouldn't say but, we are absolutely thrilled to have six of our fellows here and you'd rather hear from them than me. So I'm gonna turn it over now to our first fellow, which is Jay Winkler. Thank you so much. Uh, hello. Um, there we go. All right, uh, my name is Jay Winkler, and I am the metadata archivist at the ICPSR, which is a social science data archive housed at the University of Michigan. Uh, I've been working with a team from the Temple University Library on a project involving enhancing and analyzing Wikidata records for black artists from the Philadelphia area. Uh, my project mentors, uh, Sinatra Smith, Alex Wormer Collin and Holly Tomrin worked with a team from the Philadelphia Museum of Art to conceptualize the project. Uh, and I did work with a second fellow at my site, uh, Rebecca Bayek of the uh, Schomburg Center at the New York Public Library. For the unfamiliar, Wikidata is an attempt to uh, apply structured data to all of the world's information. It's built on RDF triples, so each item can have statements attached showing the properties of that item. Uh, in our research, our most common triple was that a person has the occupation artist. Uh, our project had two phases. Uh, the first was to make a large number of Wikidata edits to help the Philadelphia Museum of Art improve their presence on Wikidata and also improve the presence of Philadelphia's black artists more generally. Uh, to those ends, I personally made about 1,500 Wikidata edits with my partner making a similar number. Uh, most of those edits were made using OpenRefine, which has really robust tools for uh, direct ingest into Wikidata. Phase two involved designing queries that utilize Sparkle, which is a SQL-based language for querying RDF triples. Uh, and we use that to gather information from the Wikidata query service. Uh, we developed a large query as a team that gathered demographic information about the artists, and we used that in order to form our research questions. Uh, what I became very interested in was how frequently race, race and ethnicity was tagged on Wikidata. Uh, I saw that African American was the most commonly used ethnicity in our data set, uh, but that its use was far outpaced by null entries. Uh, almost everyone who has their ethnicity tagged at all in Wikidata is a person of color, making invisible the overall whiteness of the platform. Uh, obviously, not every untagged person is white, but I believe that Wikidata's structure and its editor habits uh, make it really easy to treat whiteness as a default. My main research focus became finding a way to track whether the collection of artists with tagged ethnicities was growing or shrinking over time uh, relative to the whole Wikidata collection. The query service won't return the creation date for uh, items, uh, so I ran a Sparkle query to get a collection of every artist on the platform that was born in the United States, uh, and then I was able to run that list through the Wikidata API to gather the creation dates for each artist's item. Um, if my research question was, how is this changing over time? Ultimately, my results concluded that it has stayed remarkably steady. Uh, I have two caveats up front. Uh, first, I did collapse all other tagged ethnicities into a single other category. That is not ideal, but the numbers for most are really small, and having other as a single category still provides useful insight on whether or not ethnicity tagging is happening at all. Uh, second, I don't think this data is sufficient to conclusively say whether or not any given ethnic group is underrepresented on Wikidata but I do think the defaulting of whiteness is, uh, is evident in this data. In the total collection, Wikidata's items about African Americans as a percentage of all artists settled in around 6% in 2014 and stayed within a percentage point of that uh, ever since. Uh, for reference, African Americans represent about 13% of the US population. Um, other accounted for about 4.5%, meaning around 89% of artists have no tagged ethnicity. 
Uh, when I broke this down by city, I found that Detroit had an unusually high other percentage, but most, uh, most cities track pretty closely to the national data. Um, the, the one thing I want to point out is in the Philadelphia subset, first of all, Philadelphia has always far outpaced other cities in African American representation. It's always hovered closer to 15%. But if you look uh, in the little circle on the chart, you can see the effects of our project, which I found really gratifying. Uh, there's about a month where it goes from 15% to 18% in the course of a month, and that's clearly due to phase one of our project. Uh, my big takeaways from leading in general are I feel like I have a much stronger foundation in data science coding and a lot more confidence solving problems through code. Uh, I also have found that it's given me a lot of direction uh, as an early career academic in my first role where publication is an expectation. And when the fellowship ends this month, uh, I'm going to continue working with the Detroit Institute of Art to do a Detroit-based version of phase one of our project, and then I'm going to complete some independent research tracking these sorts of patterns in Wikidata's gender and sexuality data. Thank you very much, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Ping O'Brien, and I'm the Digital Repository Metadata Librarian at Worcester Polytechnic <laughs> Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. My project is unlocking and linking World War II Japanese American incarceration biographical data with a focus on social network analysis. And I had a partner for this fellowship project, Lencia, whose presentation will follow mine. So for the project, uh, we use historical records um, obtained by Richard Marciano from the University of Maryland, who's here, who has served as our mentor. So thank you, Richard. And um, part of the historical data set um, I used was from incident cards, or also known as index cards, from the Tule Lake concentration camp located in California. Um, these cards um, included information regarding description of events, incidents, including crime that uh, incarceries were accused of by uh, public officials, including camp police. Uh, so this information not only described the event, how to category the type of event, as well as other information about the individuals. So um, what I was really interested in, and um, the, my question for this project was how can we use this archival historical data to show how the incarcerated peoples connected with each other and reveal relationships and other events and especially looking at communal acts of resistance um, and to tell us more about the life of Japanese Americans in these concentration camps. Um, so the objectives were promote the access and use of historical public records as data, but also understand the history of the records while using the data ethically and responsibly, and create a model overall for other narratives um, of serial force displacement in America. Um, so the approach that I used was um, social network analysis, um, which is specifically addresses the field of data analytics that uses networks and graph theory to understand social structures. So for this case, social network analysis involved um, extracting data from the data set of index cards and applying graph algorithms uh, found within networking tools, so specifically using Python um, library, including uh, Plotly, as well as NetworkX. Um, and one of the accomplishments um, we're really proud of is we created Jupyter Notebook specifically. I was able to create one on social network analysis that included the Python computational work as well as the output, which are these visualizations. So in the visualization um, on this slide, um, the large blue circle, it's a simple node graph used uh, with network X. And this is pulled from a particular event on November 4th, 1943 that occurred at the Tule Lake concentration camp. <laughs> Um, it was a congregation of Japanese Americans uh, who were dissatisfied with the situation, lack of supplies, lack of food, and this became deemed a riot by public officials. And so looking on November 4th, the category of the card was riot. This is how many cards, almost 4,000 cards um, that were from that, recorded from that particular event, including the individuals accused of being involved in that riot. So while it can be a difficult um, graph to read. Uh, you can just see the scope of the event itself and how many people were involved or accused of being involved. So this riot event I was really interested in, riot, and um, wanted to know more about what led up to it, what followed, tell us more about, um, again, the events um, and the lives of the incarcerees. 
Um, so one particular um, event I uh, found through the computations is November 1st, 1943, there was a theft, so this occurred before the riot, and there were nine cards specifically with the same exact description of nine in accused incarcerates of found picking vegetables in an area of the farm where they did not work. So um, I used another uh, Python library, in this case Plotly, to create a bar chart. X-axis is the different events um, categories and from the index cards. The Y-axis is the number of cards. So not only this conf was confirming, yes, there were nine cards from that specific event, but also shows other events leading up to, again, the, the riot event and following, including disorderly conduct, and after the riot, those that were jailed in the military stockade. So, you know, from these examination of these results, the theft that you can see um, and other events like disorderly conduct, they were clear displays of the rising discontent in the Thule Lake camp. And it also leads to questions regarding the informal gathering of the accused incarcerates and additional other intentional um, acts of, you know, what was planned, was the planned, uh, was the theft planned, what was talked about when they were accused, what was talked about, is this why some people, some of the incarcerates were involved in the riot later. And uh, with social network analysis, we can easily view different interactions between individuals over time and how they relate to other events, uh, ultimately presenting additional opportunities for analysis and research. So, you know, this has been really an amazing project to work on. I feel very honored to work on this project and to work with Lencia as well as work with my mentors, Richard and uh, also Greg Jansen from University of Maryland. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot, a lot about the technical aspects of working with the data, how far you know, I can push myself, how far I can wor work with the data itself, but also, most importantly, to work with historical data respectfully um, and sensitively. And my hope is for others to use these Jupyter notebooks as examples and guidance when working with archival data and continue to develop new strategies and ultimately create new opportunities for research, especially with other historical events, um, data involving serial force displacement. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Lincia Beltran. I'm the Special Collections Archivist at UNC uh, Wilmington. And so as my partner Emily said, I'm also working on the Japanese American Project. So um, my focus and interest has been to visually understand the movement and spaces of how Japanese Americans um, lived while incarcerated during World War II. And so uh, with that being said, the, um, I use geographic data taken from three separate archival records. Um, and that includes uh, one of the data sets that Emily mentioned during her presentation, what, which was the uh, incident card or uh, index card data set. And so before I could create the um, interactive maps, I had to find the locations for all five movements for 25 um, selected individuals. And so I selected the individuals based on how um, often they appeared as being involved in the uprising at Thule Lake. And so once I found those uh, locations, I could then um, find the uh, latitude and longitude, um, which is what I used to create the um, points on the maps. And so this first visualization here um, is showing uh, individual movement uh, for all five movements um, for one individual person out of the 25. And those movements are the point of origin, the assembly center, first incarceration camp, um, the relocation to Thule Lake, and the final departure state. And so to briefly describe what you're seeing here, um, the uh, individual um, originated in San Diego, California, and in 1942, they were sent um, to the Assembly Center in Santa Anita, and then from there, they were sent to Jerome, uh, the first incarceration center in Arkansas, and um, on September of 1943, they were relocated to Thule Lake, and from there, it's recorded in 1946 that their last departure state was in Pennsylvania. 
And so if I could um, have you look at the map that's on, on the lower bottom um, uh, left side, um, this map is uh, showing the number or size of uh, individuals uh, at each location for all five movements. Um, and what I want you to take away from this map is if you compare it with the first one that I showed you, you'll see that not all uh, 25 individuals were sent to the same uh, assembly center or the same um, first uh, incarceration center, or even they didn't have the same uh, final departure state. And then the map that is on the top right, uh, oh, real quick, I'm gonna backtrack. Uh, this, the second and first map were created using Plotly, which is uh, one of Python's libraries. Um, okay. And then the third map is, was created using Folium, which is again, um, another Python library, but it's an alternative way to uh, use interactive maps to visually see um, movements. Um, Folium uses layers, um, so it'll allow users to either um, select or deselect what is visibly being shown if they want to see specific information. It also allows them to, uh, or uh, in the creator to add GeoJSON or shape files, which I uh, added. Those are the blue shape files on the map. Um, those are a uh, uh, represent evacuation orders. Um, and real quick, uh, the image between the two maps are the code that I used to um, filter the data to find the locations. So in conclusion, I, um, my experience with leading and as a leading fellow has been a positive one. Um, I learned a lot from my two mentors, Richard, Dr. Richard Marciano and Greg Jansen from the Advanced Information Collaboratory. I also learned a lot from my partner, Emily, and I learned that data um, can be, or, or data science approaches and computational approaches can be used for historical research and not just uh, numerical data. Thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Hyun Seung Go. I'm an assessment librarian at the University of Northern Iowa. My uh, project of mine is top university library project called Data and Decision Making for Consortial Evil Acquisition. A particular goal of this project is to create visualization tool that would help identify which Boston Library Consortium PLC member can work together to save or share acquisition cost by showing which BRC members are similar to each other in terms of subject-based ebook usage patterns. To achieve this goal, we exported consortium ebook usage data from 2018 to 2021 from JSTOR admin portals and prepared for analysis as a pilot study. And then we created multiple network graph modeling and overlapping usage of title in particular subject area across the PLC members. In particularly, we chose a bipart network graph with a Python and its library network X, where one kind of node is a PLC member and the other kind of node is a subject. And the line between a member node and subject node define an institution's usage of a particular subject area and divide by their usage of all subject areas. So this is a particular example of bipartite network graph. If you look at the history at the center and the line from the history to individual peers member eight, the thickness of eight is eight of peers members that are similar to each other. This means that eight uh, peers members, they have a similar ebook usage pattern in terms of history. However, if you look at the philosophy on the right side, you will notice that philosophy is a unique <laughs> subject of peers one, the ebook usage of which does not have a similar ebook usage pattern as any other BRC members. So BRC member might not need to consider cost sharing in terms of philosophy. And additionally, if you look at the sociology next to the history, 
And you will notice that the line from sociology into the individual BLC member, the thickness is similar to each other. However, as compared to history, the thickness is thinner with a lower usage of even usage data. So one takeaway from this uh, project itself, we were able to identify which subject area are strong or weak candidate for consortium acquisition. So history and sociology are good example of strong candidate for consortium ebook acquisition. And philosophy is one example of weak candidates. So in terms of takeaway from reading fellowship itself, among many, uh, it, this fellowship took me one step further and closer to achieving my goal of becoming a well-rounded assessment librarian that I mentioned in my application form by helping me gain immediately applicable collection-related uh, knowledge and skill that I did not have before, and helping me build an extensible partnership with a mentor. So as a next uh, step with this project, we are planning to gather more data from more vendors. We are planning to use LC classification instead of um, JSTOR disciplines. And we are planning to build an interactive network graph would enable individual users to uh, configure their threshold until they get meaningful insight. And I really wanted to thank you for all the mentor and support and their willingness to meet me and talk with me and get some help from, yeah, for me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Proctor. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Maryland College Park and I worked with the OCLC on a project to detect missing diacritics in catalog records that were ingested into OCLC from works published in Russia. Sit. No, okay, here we go. Okay, so the project goals were to build a machine learning mod model capable of identifying incorrect Cyrillic mark records on ingest. And at the scale OCLC works, this is a big data problem. Also, we wanted to develop methods for identifying and mapping corrections for transliteration errors. In order to do this, we needed to label 4.5 million rows using OpenRefine and Python. And we tested dozens of machine learning algorithms, encountered many scalability issues, got a lot of 33 terabytes of RAM cannot be allocated errors. <laughs> and um, we had to do some research on other diacritic restoration projects, of which there's about one to two dozen around the world in about six-ish languages. So this is an emerging area. Um, and we had to develop new methods for splitting transliterated text into compound characters that would fit three trigrams, four grams, five grams, because while in Cyrillic you can just count th three letters, four letters, five letters, when you transliterate that, one can turn into four. It can have diacritics. It can have stress marks that look like quotation marks that then the software doesn't know what to do with. And through all of that, different catalogers can parse those inconsistently. And that all complicates using computers and AI to parse these records. So our approach, we labeled the data, we built machine learning models, we reassessed the data, we scaled the models, and then we added some explainability methods. But throughout all of our challenges, I remained super excited about this project because the challenges for libraries, archives, museums, and natural language processing technology in general for handling this kind of linguistic complexity is what drove me into PhD research. 
and this is the first opportunity I've had to get my hands on data and actually work on this kind of project. So it's been fantastic. Mm -hmm. And these are the kinds of results that we've been looking at. So calibrated classifiers, the first model that we got some results on, used a hash on the titles, so turning strings into numbers so that they could be calculated. We hashed it with two to the eighth columns per title, and that got us some results, but as you can see, all the arrows kind of converged together, which isn't ideal. Two to the third got us a little bit better. They tended to go into their own little boxes, but it's still not great. So on top of that, we still needed to use rules-based and statistical modeling with n-grams. So our, the other chart shows some of those n-grams once we figured out the problems with separating out what counts as one character when one character can actually be four different characters that represent one Cyrillic letter. So we are looking at a combination of machine learning models, rules, and statistical modeling together to give us this capability of helping OCLC to clean up its Cyrillic ingests on, at big scales. So, okay. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Young. I am a science and technology librarian at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, my project was with Montana State University. And uh, our goal was to develop a, a measure or a metric um, for an academic library to calculate a return on investment value or, or a cost benefit analysis um, based on uh, the grant revenues coming into a university that's supported by library subscriptions. And uh, first I wanna say a disclaimer. Obviously the library supports uh, the university in many ways beyond just grant revenues, but this is one uh, simple way to apply data science to get a kind of lower bound estimate of how much support the library is giving to the university. And so my approach uh, is shown in that in figure, and it basically adds two factors to the total grant amount. Um, using the assumption that uh, library support of grant proposals is primarily through the cited references that are cited in the proposal. And you can see, again, why this is an assumption and it's a lower bound. Um, but those two factors are one, uh, the, the library support percentage. So that would be the proportion of the cited references found in a grant proposal that are provided through a library subscription. And second, the citation dependence, or how much of a grant's probability of success is actually dependent on having cited references at all. Um, but the main problem is that uh, if, if you try to look for the data, and certainly this is true for Montana State um, and for uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, if you're given data on, on grant proposals, they don't include the proposal and they don't in definitely don't include the cited references used in the proposal. So I needed to come up with an approach to try to estimate the cited references that were used in a proposal. And um, I first tried to do uh, natural language processing and that failed completely. Um, but I settled on using uh, Web of Science data um, by looking at the cited references in a principal investigator's publications and using that as a proxy for the cited references they would use in the proposal. And so I, I, I used four, combined four data sets. One uh, was a validation data, data set um, from a public database, uh, ogrants.org, that did have cited, refer, uh, cited references in the full proposals. Um, to show that that um, process worked, and uh, also found that there was a difference between cited references in funded and unfunded grants, so it's great to see the library actually does make a difference. Um, and that also allowed me to calculate that citation dependence term um, by estimating the probability of success for a grant with zero references. And um, then the other three data sets were the uh, Montana State grant uh, data, the Web of Science data, and the uh, Alma library subscription data. And I combined those to, to get that final library support value. And you can see plugging in all the numbers into that formula there. Um, for Montana State for the last five years, we come out with um, 
an ROI of uh, $4.83 uh, of grant revenue that's supported by the library for every $1 of library materials budget, um, which is consistent with previous work using non-data science methods, such as survey methods, um, so, that, so that's good to see. Um, and I hope it'll be useful to library directors like, like Kenning from Montana, Montana State. Um, but the data science approach actually has another advantage in that it can provide more data you know, on a journal by journal level, um, which is what I'm most interested in as not a library director, but as a academic um, selector and liaison. And that was one of the great things about the leading project um, that uh, it provided the flexibility that um, I could um, tailor the project in a way that was gonna help me in my, in my role. And as an example, on the bottom left, um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, I had just started my position, and um, I was told, like I'm sure many universities, that I needed to reevaluate uh, some of the journal selections. And so, you know, I created a, a, a chart like this, and with as many data points as I could, such as usage, such as impact factor, citations, but it was missing what role these journals were playing in our, in our grant revenue at the university. And so I've been simultaneously trying to focus on that, and I'm very happy that the leading projects have been able to allow me to do that. Um, and then going forward, kind of in the far future, also integrate it into a visualization, like a network map, uh, like I show on the right, to, to help my role as, as a liaison as well. And so uh, I thank the leading program to, uh, to give me the kickstart to be able to do that kind of uh, work as a, as a librarian. So I have the pleasure of wrapping us up here. I just would like to say uh, thank you to all of our presenting fellows of really amazing work. Uh, this is just a selection of the incredible 24 projects uh, that we got to highlight this year, got to work with this year through our 24 fellows. Um, I'd like to uh, say that even just we're in our first year of the leading program, of course, we're extending the leads program. We've already seen some fellows uh, secure new jobs coming out of this, which I think is one of our big goals of this program is to support career development of early career professionals. Um, I will say uh, we will be launching the 2022 applications uh, for leading, and so if you have uh, doctoral students or early career professionals who would be excited to be part of this program, we would really uh, like to talk more and certainly would be glad to see applications to the program. As I wrap us up, uh, we would really like to thank uh, IMLS for their support. Uh, for this project. A big thank you to our advisory board, including our good friend Cliff Lynch, uh, our Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Board, all of our fellows, our mentors and faculty who are making this program a success. Uh, you can stay in touch uh, with it, uh, the cci.drexel.edu. It's part of the Metadata Resource Center. Uh, it's up in the slides we'll be sharing. And I think we've got about six or seven minutes for questions. And so I'll uh, turn the floor over to all of you to see what questions you have. Thank you. give folks a moment to join us. Maybe a, a question to our fellows. You know, I think you presented really exemplary show uh, in products. Uh, we know that one of the challenges you ran into was actually scoping your work. Uh, would any of you like to reflect on what that experience was like? <laughs> Politically unsensitive or sensitive question. <laughs> Uh, I think I was somewhat lucky in that a lot of my scoping actually came from my mentors. Um, something, I've got a forthcoming blog post about my actual, uh, the actual queries I ran, and at one point in the blog post I say we cheated a little bit by uh, creating a Wikidata list prior to starting the project, uh, and had, had my mentors not created that list, a lot of my queries would have just like timed out. Uh, because they were way too big. Um, so I got lucky in that sense. Uh, and then other than that, when I started moving away from some of the stuff that was pre prepared for me in advance, um, a lot of it was just what are the cities I find the most interesting? Uh, is there any way I can in integrate uh, Detroit and or Ann Arbor uh, so that I could take it locally a little bit more? And so, yeah. Um, a lot of my scoping 
uh, work came with when do I stop labeling and start modeling? And how do I deal with not knowing how long a model will need to run? I just have to wait and see when it's going to finish. And if there are going to be results when it's going to finish, or if it's going to crash while I'm sleeping, and I'm going to have to start over again. So some of the results are this weekend's results. <laughs> <laughs> so I did my best to scope, and we got there, but some of it was a little hair-raising. <laughs> I saw give our audience members one more moment while I shield my eyes from the blinding light. I'm not seeing any movement. I will uh, thank you all for being part of our session. Uh, really looking forward to continuing this project with all of our fellows and mentors. And so thank you so much.